Well, I issue you words of greetings on this Holy Trinity Sunday as we gather together in this beautiful sanctuary, and I welcome those of you who are worshiping with us online. Many of you know that our congregation, church council members, trustees, and others have been in dialogue for many years about ways that we engage in worship, particularly for persons who are more visual learners. And so for the past several Sundays, you've had an insert in your bulletin with the words printed on them for the offertory and the anthem that you may be able to really take those words of the lyrics of the beautiful music into your soul and into your spirit. And our trustees and church council and others have worked very diligently so that we now have a projection system so that we can start projecting on the walls on either side of me. We will not have screens, so you don't have to kind of go in panic mode here. Um, we will project on the walls those words of the anthems and the operatories um, in the next several weeks. Right now, we'd like to start using these projection systems to share with you the announcements that I make each Sunday so that you, again, especially for visual learners, can take that in. And so we invite those persons who are watching online as well as those of you in the congregation to be patient with us as we get used to this new system together with one another. But right now, I want to share with you a few announcements of things that are going on, and you will see these announcements on either side of me on the walls. First, I'd like to remind you that Christine Taylor, a wonderful director of engagement, will be leading several movie discussions this summer, one per month. One of those is going to be on a man called Otto. The other movie will be won't You Be My Neighbor? And the third movie discussion that will take place in August is Where the Crawdads Sing. So we encourage you to watch these movies on your own at home and then engage with Christine and others for this movie discussion time. I also want to remind you that Sarah Kate, our wonderful director of children and youth ministries, is actively recruiting volunteers to help her with Vacation Bible School and recruiting young persons to participate in Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School will be held July 10th through the 14th, and many exciting things are planned for that. There is a sign-up table outside in the North X area for you to sign up, or you can reach out to Sarah Kate to get involved in that. And the final announcement I'd like to make for you today is a solicitation for your prayers for this coming week. Beginning this afternoon, the South Carolina Annual Conference will be meeting in Florence, South Carolina. You'll see on the slides the names of our lay delegates. Austin and I, of course, will be there as well. We ask you to keep all of us and all of the delegates in your heart and in your prayers as we discuss the work of the annual conference. And we will come back to you and share with you highlights of that conference next week. You can also engage in the annual conference by going to the South Carolina Annual Conference website and watch some of the proceedings online as they will be live streamed. So thank you very much for um, participating in each one of these. And now, as the children of God, let us stand together and unite our voices as we prepare for worship with our call to worship. We gather in the name of the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We remember that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We believe the scriptures that proclaim, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We also know that in the beginning the Spirit of God swept over the face of the earth's darkness and brought forth a kaleidoscope of diversity and life. And in the beginning God said, let us make humankind in our image. And so all of humanity came into being created by God who exists in community as the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. We are here as our triune God's community of love, and we are ready to worship the source of our being and the reason for our hope. Amen.
You may be seated. And then if you would join me in the prayer of confession found printed in your bulletin, let us pray. Holy God, we were created in your image, an image of mutuality and respect for one another, an image of dance ever moving, ever in tune one with others, an image of community with shared blessing and mission. You have given us dominion over the work of your hands. You have charged us to be fruitful and multiply, to make disciples of all nations. Yet we confess that we have abused the earth's resources for our own selfish gain. The consequences of our abuse have wrecked havoc upon the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living thing that moves upon the earth. Forgive us, God, for all the ways we have defiled your image and your creation. We confess that there is much that is broken and difficult, painful and hateful in this world. Help us to see how our words and actions, our apathy and our silence, contribute to the pain and hurt all around us. We trust that you hear us now as we silently confess our sins before you in prayer. Hear the good news. God desires to see broken relationships restored and has heard our prayers. In the name of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now I would like to invite the children to come forward and join Mr. Dane and Miss Cindy and Darby for children's moments. Come on up. Good morning. Morning, Lucas. Good morning, children. Good morning. Wow, such enthusiasm. <laughs> Good morning, congregate. Wow, that's new. We're going to have to get used to that, aren't we? Good morning, congregation. Can y'all say good morning, Mr. Lewis, the organist? Good morning, Mr. Lewis. Good morning, Mr. Lewis. So, today, Darby and I have a couple of questions for you. Everybody ready? You ready? Great. Okay. First, let's ask the congregation. Congregation, how many of you have learned about Jesus? How many of you know Jesus? Look out there. Okay. Children, how many of you have learned about God and Jesus? Raise your hand if you've learned about God and Jesus. Yeah, all of us have. And, and you've learned about your foot. That's great. Okay, so here's my next question. How did you learn about Jesus? How did you find out? Anyone want to share? Sure, Teddy. By looking in the Bible. By looking in the Bible. That's a great way. Any other ways? Anybody else find out in a different way? How did you find out about Jesus? I learned about it in Sunday school. Got it. Well, it's for sure true that a lot of times people learn about Jesus from someone else telling them or someone else teaching them. But what about children who are maybe not here and haven't heard or learned about Jesus before? How do they learn about Jesus? Let's see. So Darby's holding up a little picture, and this is a little boy. Let's call Oh, it's a little girl. Okay, sorry. It's a little girl that Darby drew. And let's say that this little girl is Lucy. And Lucy knows all about Jesus because she's got this little red cross in her hand, right? But way across the world, there's a little boy. We don't know his name. How about, can anyone give me the name of a place that's really far away? Anybody know a place far away? What do you, what do you think, Lucas? Israel. That's great. So there's a little boy in Israel 
we were expecting something like Lexington or something closer. Israel that doesn't know about Jesus. Now how can Lucy, poor Lucy here all alone, how can she let teach this little boy way over in Israel about Jesus? How can she do that? Is that even possible? Well, let's see. If Lucy would first of all tell Lathan, and then Lathan would tell Teddy, and then Teddy would tell his mom, and then his mom would tell her uncle, and her uncle would tell school teachers, pretty soon there's all these people in between Lucy, who's here, and this little boy. Do I have it backwards? Lucy, little boy. Lucy, who's here, and little boy way over in Israel could maybe get the message. Should we see what happens? Let's see if Lucy shares the message about Jesus. Let's see what happens. Whoa. Look at that. We'll let you do it in children's church for sure. The little boy in Israel got the message. Isn't that awesome? So sharing the message of Jesus is so important. There's a story in the Bible about it. And the Reverend Becky is actually going to teach the congregation about that story today. But what would happen if we didn't listen to Jesus? In this story, Jesus tells us that the most important thing we should be doing is sharing the word about him and teaching others. What if some of us decided not to share? Let's see what that looks like. Here's a little girl, let's say she's in Israel too, who doesn't know Jesus. And Lucy starts telling all of us, like she did, and sharing, what happens if someone doesn't share? Let's see. Whoa. Did the little girl in Israel get the message? No. That's too bad. Tell you what, let's tell Darby, make her share. Let's make that little girl share. Can you tell Darby, make that little girl share? Okay, what happens when she shares? Wow, then the message gets through. It's really important for us, and Jesus has taught us that it's important to spread his word. It's what created the church 2,000 years ago, and it's what's making our church grow today here. Will you all pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you. for teaching us to spread your word. To spread your word. Oh, Amen. Let's go to Children's Church, everybody.
That was absolutely beautiful, wasn't it? <sighs> the beauty of God's earth. And we are called to be in co-mission with Christ to keep the beauty of this earth going. Today is not only Trinity Sunday, it is also Peace with Just Justice Sunday in the United Methodist Church. And we are called to be in that mission of carrying out the work of peace and justice in this world. I want to invite the youth and the adults who are preparing to leave this coming Saturday to work through the South Carolina United Methodist Conference for Sakahatchee. I'd like to invite all those youth and adults to come forward right now that we may pray for them and we may recognize them for they have accepted the call to work with God, to be on this co-mission with God you will notice on the slides, on the walls, the names of each one of these missionaries as they go out. I'm going to meet y'all right down here at the chancel rail. And I'm calling you all forward because I want you to remember that this is your family right here. Washington Street United Methodist Church, your siblings united to you in love through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your lives and we know that we are sending you out out of your comfort zone for some of you to meet some of your other family members family members that you haven't met yet for all of humanity is the family of God and so it is our hope and our prayer that the bonds of Christian love will grow deeper and stronger as you meet these new family members and that as you engage in the work that God has gifted you to do. So I want you to turn around and I want you to look at me for a moment and I want to ask you some important questions because I and the members of this congregation celebrate your devotion and your faithfulness and you're willing to give of your time and your talent. And I know that you also gave of your money because you pay for the privilege of working <laughs> on people's homes in the summer and the humidity of South Carolina. So thank you for doing that. It is a privilege, but it is also a responsibility. And so I need to ask you a few questions. And if you will respond in the affirmative, I ask you to simply respond to these questions by saying, I will, with God's help. So here's the first question. Will you accept the persons whom you serve right where they are and just the way they are. Will you seek to work in glad cooperation and mutual support with the other workers, being sensitive and helpful according to their needs? Will you conduct yourself in a manner which will demonstrate your love of Christ and this church whom you represent? And now a question that you'll respond to differently. If you respond in the affirmative, simply say, I do. Do you sincerely believe that the work you are about to undertake is truly the work of God in this world for the transformation 
of the world. Then I commission you now to share the love of Jesus Christ and your gifts through the service with Sakahatchee Summer Servers in the camp that you will go to. You go as representatives of Christ and you go as representatives of Washington Street United Methodist Church. I invite you to join me in prayer. Let us bow. Almighty God, we thank you for how you call each of us to your purpose. But today we give you special thanks for calling this group of youth and adults. Endow them with your Holy Spirit. Enrich them with your grace. Strengthen them for the task which lies ahead and give them unity and direction through your Spirit that through their work your name may be glorified. Amen. Now I want you to turn around and face the congregation. My dear friends, I commend these fine folks to your love and to your care. We ask for your prayers and your support for the work that they will perform. And so now I need to ask you, do you rejoice to recognize them as representatives of Washington Street United Methodist Church and thank God for their dedication and their gift of service? Will you send them forth with your prayers and your support and with them renew your commitment to God and service in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord? Then may it be so. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all for your service. God's blessings of peace upon you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As they return to their seats, I remind us that God has called each and every one of us to accept the cost and the joy of discipleship for the sake of God's wholeness in this world, God's work of peace, and God's work of justice. And serving as missionaries is just one of the ways that we can do that. But through the United Methodist Church, we are also very aware that as annual conference is about to take place, that there is much division within our denomination. And so God's work of peace and justice is needed not only in the community, but also within the church. There are so many who are suffering in our world as the war in Ukraine continues to go on, and wars and battles are being fought all over the place. And so part of what we do as United Methodist on Peace with Justice Sunday is we take up a special offering for the work of peace and justice through agencies in local communities and around the globe. I invite you during this time, as we give our tithes and offerings to the work of peace and justice here at Washington Street, that you also give a little to United Methodist causes outside the walls of this church. Half of the funds that we give to Peace with Justice Ministries and the South Carolina Annual Conference will stay in the South Carolina Annual Conference, and the other half will go to global causes of peace and justice through the United Methodist Church. So now let us receive God's tithes and our offerings. Praise to the Lord of the small broken things, who sees the poor sparrow that cannot take wing, who loves the lame child and the wretch in the street. 
who comforts their sorrows and washes their feet. Praise to the Lord of the faint and afraid, who gives them with courage and lends their knees aid. He pours out his spirit on vessels so weak that the timid can serve and the silent can speak. Praise to the Lord of the frail and the ill, who heals their afflictions, or carries them till they leave this dire frame and to paradise fly, to never be sick and never to die, there to die. Praise Him, oh praise Him, all ye who yet live, who've been given so much and can so little give. Our frail lips sing praise, God will never despise. He sees his dear children through mercy.
I invite you to remain standing out of respect for the gospel reading, which today comes from Matthew's gospel, the 28th chapter, known as the Great Commission. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came near and spoke to them, I've received all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. I read a story about a baseball player named Larry Anderson. He was a pitcher with Houston in San Diego. He was a middle reliever who spent a lot of time in the bullpen. And bullpens, I understand, can be kind of lonely places to be, especially for someone with a philosophical mind and with a fertile ground for the imagination to just take you away. And so in the bullpen... Larry Anderson contemplated what he called unexplained mysteries of the universe. And among those mysteries that he said are unexplained that he could not understand were these. Why is there an expiration date on sour cream? Why do people park in a driveway and drive on a parkway? Why do fat chance and slim chance mean the same thing? And why do your feet smell but your nose runs? Unexplained things. Well, I'm kind of like Larry Anderson. There are many things in life that I have trouble explaining. Many things in life that I truly do not understand. I will be heading to Florence this afternoon and this morning. Richard asked me, he said, now how do you get to Florence from here? What, What highway do you take? I said, I'm really not sure. My smartphone will tell me how to do it. Now, I don't know how my phone knows where I am and where I need to go versus the person who's right beside me and where they need to go. How do all that data get transferred in the airwaves and not get confused? How can I be sure that my phone is not going to send me to New York instead of Florence? I just trust. There are many things in life that we can't understand or explain but we have to accept and live by. That's true for our existence, and that's true for our faith. There's much about life and faith that remains a mystery to all of us. And the Trinity is one of those doctrines of the church that the church rightly calls a mystery. A mystery. Our questions about who God is and how God can be one but known in three persons as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit We call the doctrine of the Trinity, but no preacher and no theologian can explain it. And yet we try. We keep trying. Every year on Trinity Sunday, we are asked to look at this doctrine of the Trinity and to think about it. Irish preachers like to use their national emblem, the three-leaved shamrock, Some early preachers used the term root and shoot and fruit. And others looked at the sun with this ray of light and the point of the ray that touched the earth. And you will hear many preachers today refer to God as creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Not just Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But somewhere along my seminary education, I read that for very early Christians, they liked to celebrate and refer to the Trinity as a dance. And maybe some of you have seen this portrayed in artwork around the world. A dance. A dance used to demonstrate power and grace, majesty, love and tenderness, presence and movement of the divine. 
I had the wonderful opportunity yesterday to spend time with my beloved grandson, Joey. Joey is now 19 months old, and he loves music of all sorts, whether it's coming from one of his little electronic toys or something on television, or whether it's something that I or others are singing to him. And the minute he hears music, he starts just moving all over the place. He loves to dance and move. I think most children do. There's something freeing about moving and dancing. But as I watched him dance, I thought about the intricacies of dance and the fact that the Trinity is a dance, a dance between creator, redeemer, and sustainer, a dance of motion, a dance of flexibility, a dance of rhythm, a dance of emotion. The nature of the relationships of the Godhead is a beautiful dance of movement in and out and flow. The divine dance was dubbed perichoresis using the Greek word choreo, which is the way of persons of the Godhead contained and filled by the others for that beautiful flow of a dance, beautiful flow of the dance. In this dance of the partners, they not only encircle one another and weave in and out between each other as in human dancing, but then in the divine dance, it is so intimate to the communion that they move in and out and through each other, that that pattern is all inclusive. And so we say we worship one God. We worship not three, but one. We worship the unity, the unity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in other words, that tension, that beauty, that mystery of the unity is really about a relationship a relationship built on love. Now, a point of clarification here. Unity does not mean sameness. If God wanted sameness, God would not have created the world that we see all around us. Look around the room at all the differences. All the differences that you see. Even the people seated beside you, even if they're your own family members, they look different. They think different. They feel different things. God created beautiful diversity in this world. And the Holy Trinity is a model of the kind of unity that we are called to embrace in the midst of the diversity. Diversity. A unity that is communal and relational. In the reading from the Gospel of Matthew that we read today, we zoom in on a moment after Jesus' resurrection. Jesus is commissioning his disciples to go forth and to make more disciples. And he tells them to go, therefore, into all the nations. All the nations. I focused in on that word, all. Because think about the diversity in the nations. Think about the diversity from community to community, from culture to culture, Jesus sends them out to all nations, knowing full well that each nation is saturated in its own context, with its own culture, its own language, its own traditions. And I think that's why the Holy Spirit came with the diversity of languages on Pentecost Sunday, to help bring us together as a human race. Each nation is different but by uniting different nations into following Jesus Christ, Jesus is inviting the church on this mission of unity. Jesus is inviting the church into the tension, into the interrelationship, into all of the differences that we have. And he commanded those disciples to baptize all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, reminding them that there is diversity in the unity of the Godhead as well. And because of the diversity of cultures and context and personalities, we all know that the expressions of Christianity have been shaped by the environment in which the people are populated. There is truly no such thing as one Christianity. Instead, there is a groundswell of many Christianities. 
Conservatively, I have read that there are about 34,000 different denominations recognized within 21st century Christianity. But some other faith counters put that number much, much higher, parsing Jesus' followers around 122,000 different tribes. Now, there are two dangers to this splintering of Christianity. And the first is, if everything's called Christianity, then nothing's called Christianity, right? If everything goes, then nothing st is standard. Not every spiritual sputtering can be called Christianity. But the second danger is a hazard that I think we fall into. It's a hazard that I read about that every baby chicken faces. Now, I don't raise chickens myself, but I know several of you have chickens in your backyard and that maybe you were raised on a farm and you know something more about chickens. But this is what I read. It says, if one chick in a flock looks or behaves differently from the rest of the baby chicks, its days are numbered. Because eventually, one chicken in that flock will start pecking at that chicken that's a little bit different and they'll start pulling out the feathers of that chicken that is a little bit different, making it look even more different, which causes other chickens to start pecking at that little chicken that's different until eventually that little chicken can't survive because individuality is not tolerated in a flock of chickens. Now, unfortunately... The church of Jesus Christ is increasingly exhibiting that second danger. And it's heartbreaking. Divisions, opinions, personalities, traditions so easily divide us, creating a community with tension and conflict instead of peace and justice and agreement. We are not a people of sameness, and that often creates conflict as Christians of diversity, it can be easy to claim that God is on our side, especially when we find friends who agree with us. It takes humility to engage with and allow others to be transformed by someone different from us. In an episode of The American Life, the host says free speech doesn't solve conflict. It actually creates it. Solving conflict requires more advanced tools like trust, humility, dialogue, and listening. And that is what the dance of the Trinity reminds us of. That God made us diverse. But he also shows us how to live in harmony and unity with one another. In the Great Commission, Jesus said to go to all the nations in all their diversity knowing that there might be conflict, but what are you to do when you get there? Teach them. Teach them what? Teach them all that I have commanded you. What did Jesus command us? Jesus said all the law and the prophets are summed up in these two great commandments. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Loving each other does not mean we have to agree with each other. We are members of one family, one human family. But members of a family don't always agree with everybody on everything, do they? Of course not. But we should recognize that the people we are disagreeing with are also our siblings. They too are children of God. And loving our siblings means we need to listen to those who are speaking. Not just wait for our turn to talk. And not try so hard to convince them that our way is the right way. But listen to try to understand. Listen. Listen. Just as one times one times one equals one in the Trinity. Jesus' prayer was that we all might be one, even as He and the Father are one through the power of the Spirit. 
So Jesus' prayer, I believe, today is that Protestants and Catholics, liberals and conservatives, Anglos, Asians, blacks and Hispanics, Native Americans may all find their common denominator in Christ who makes us one. The Trinity is our example of unity. United Methodist, like some of the other denominations in Christianity, have a unique opportunity every time we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Community. A, ne a unique opportunity every, every time we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. And that is that we recognize that this sacrament is a table that is open to all, all people, all ages, all nations, all races. This table is open for whosoever will come. If you are tossed about with many conflicts and multiple doubts about your faith, Jesus says, come. Come, just as he said to Thomas who doubted, come. If you feel confused by life or excluded or shunned, or like you don't have a place to belong, Jesus says, come, come to this table of grace. If you are not United Methodist and don't understand Methodism and don't want to be Methodist, Jesus says, come, come to this table of grace, come. Jesus says, let even the little children come. Do not stop them or hinder them. Jesus says that we all must be like children, free, free to dance the movement of the Holy Spirit, Father and Son. Come, this meal is prepared for you. Theologian Moltmann says that this sacrament is not the place to practice discipline. This sacrament happens by invitation which is as opened as the outstretched arms of Jesus on the cross because he died for the reconciliation of the whole world. And so the whole world is invited to come, to come to this table, this table that is set for you and for me and for all of humanity. So I invite you to prepare your hearts and your minds to receive this holy meal as I pray. Gracious and loving God, make us one. Let your love flow so that the whole world will know we are one in you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. I invite you to turn in your bulletins for the Sacrament of Holy Communion, beginning with the Great Thanksgiving. Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy Trinity, it is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you. You are diverse, equitable, and inclusive, and you lived those divine traits through the life of Jesus. Jesus called a diverse array of disciples. They were gender diverse. They were from diverse classes of people with differing beliefs and attitudes. Jesus treated all people with equity, showing concern for women and children, believers and unbelievers, the oppressed and the oppressors, the clean and the unclean. Jesus included everyone in his love, and was saddened when some excluded themselves needlessly. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God, God of power and might, heaven, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, with humility, saw the importance of every life. 
Jesus saw others as being equal with himself. So when he took the bread of Passover to bless and break it, he gave it to all, saying, Take and eat, this is my body broken and given for you. Jesus saw others as equal with himself. So when he took the Passover wine to bless it, he shared it with all, saying, Drink with me, each of you, for this is the cup of my blood, an offering poured out in acknowledgement of God's covenant of grace, promising salvation to all. Jesus, with love, seeks to include every soul at the table of grace. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. Pour out now your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be the body of Christ redeemed for this world. Make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry throughout the world until Christ comes again and we feast at his heavenly banquet for all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, both now and forever. And so with the confidence that we are the children of God, let us now join our voices in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As those who are assisting us come forward now, I remind you that the ushers will guide you to come to the communion table, a table that is truly open to all of us. So come with your hands open to receive the bread, for it is a gift of God's grace that we cannot earn or take. We simply open ourselves to receive it. You may then dip the bread in the cup if you would like or take one of those small cups. And we do have gluten-free elements for those who need them.
If you will please be seated as those who are joining and uniting with this congregation come forward now, for we have one more very important thing to do as a congregation. If you will turn to page 38 in your hymn books, our new members joining with us today, their names are going to be projected on the walls that you might see them as they come forward. What a great joy it is to officially welcome these beautiful people into the life of our congregation. We have Sarah, Kate, um, and Heidi over here on my right, and we have Jay and Cody over here on my left. You'll see their names up on the walls so that you can write that down and reach out to them in the days and weeks ahead. As they come to become official members of this church, I need to just ask y'all a few questions. As members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? And as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Beautiful. And now I ask you, the members of Washington Street United Methodist Church, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? You do? You do. All right. Now, will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? And with God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their service to others. And we will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in a way that leads to life. And now, may the grace, the love, and the peace of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit Bring peace, comfort, and strength to each of us for the living of these days as I officially welcome these four persons into the life of this church and invite them to follow Austin and I out the doors so that you may greet them personally. Go in peace, my friends. Serve God and love one another. <laughs>